good. Very nice. All right, we're on um, week three of our Reconstructing Faith, Building a Genuine Belief in God, because we live in a world that's fallen and broken and messy, and, and so many things pull at us for our attention and our time. And so um, week one, do you remember what we talked about? Hmm? That every conversation we have needs to take place under what? In the same room as the cross of Jesus. Every conversation, every decision that you make, every um, boardroom and bathroom that is under the cross of Jesus. Because as Christ followers, we are to pick up our cross daily and follow him. And sometimes we get caught up in ourselves and we get caught up in the, you know, the drama of the world around us. And so we really need to continually put things in the right context that Jesus died to give us life and he gave us a better way of living. And so under the cross, so that's our, um, that's like our foundation. Our firm foundation is the cross of Jesus. And don't be afraid of lifting him up. Don't be afraid of sharing the good news of the gospel, including the messy, ugly parts of it with people. Week two, and that was just last week, we talked about how to put our faith into action because we are to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. We're supposed to um, see God work and then obey him and say, how am I supposed to act out what you have shown me? Because you've met a lot of people that have spoken, talked really big, right? And then they're a totally different person when things get hard or things are challenging. But that is when your faith gets tested and you do, uh, you know, you do get ugly before God. It isn't always pretty. Has anyone here gotten ugly this week before God? You and God, and it's just kind of an ugly moment. But you're here now to attest to the fact that he did not leave you nor forsake you. And so it's not just words, but it's also action. All right, so today um, we are going to be talking about, like, what if they don't believe you? What if you are living your faith and you are lifting up Jesus and you are doing the things and people say, uh, yeah, I don't see if there's anything in it for me. I don't know if I believe you in all this Jesus stuff. And, and uh, Jesus was confronted by this as well. So um, when he was confronted by it, he was bold in his testimony and he was um, brave in how he shared who he was but he also shared it in humility when he had to and boldly when he had to. But it was accompanied by what? Signs of power and authority. Even when Jesus was 13 years old and he was in the temple talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the temple, um, the keepers of the temple, and they said, what, what is going on with this young kid? He is smarter than our most learned men. You have to say it that way if you're going to sound smart. The learned men. He was even wiser than all of our guys here. He's only a 13-year-old kid. It's because he had the power of God in him. Now, we talked briefly about it today is what Sunday? Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. And so it is not um, Jesus on his own. It's kind of this thing, but he, uh, this thing that's kind of hard. He was fully God and fully man. He um, abandoned his kingliness in order to be an earthly king, in order to conquer death and the grave and give us a new way of life. But Jesus had the Spirit of God within him. He had the presence of God within him so that wherever Jesus went, whether it was into a place of worship or into a field or if it was um, where, like, it, like just going along the seashores or going to a Samaritan town where he was unwelcomed, he had the presence of God in him. And that made it obvious to everyone around Jesus who he was, that he was of God, that he had the authority. So I was thinking about this, that a lot of us like to hide our Christianity. We want to be like, I'm going to be an undercover agent for the Lord. And that is not going to work in today's times, in today's days, uh, the time of today, in the, today's culture. 
Um, in the 1950s and 60s, church attendance was an all-time high, but that's because in order to um, get any business done, you needed to make sure that you belonged to a church. So we don't know that it was an authentic type of worship service that they were going to, if people's hearts were changed. Um, Rockefeller, I know he was a really rich man, but who he was as a businessman was not who he was on a Sunday morning. Wherever you go, you need to make sure that Jesus is obvious in you. And so my question for you today, as people, if they're going to believe you or not, is Jesus obvious in you? You know, um, I was thinking about when uh, single people, how many single people do we have in here? What, what? Yep. When you're going into a grocery store or into the library or if you're going into a church that you've never been to before and you're kind of scoping out the territory, if you're like looking for somebody, some of you are happy being single and you just stay happy being single. But if you're scoping out, what do you look for? Ah, you look for wedding rings, right? No, no. I, I look for wedding rings. Like, okay, who wouldn't? No, I'm just kidding. I want to, yeah, I want to get this person that I've been praying for, and I need them to meet somebody special, and, you know, they're further along in their life, so they need to meet somebody that's going to be right fit for them. So I'm, like, looking around, and you look for, like, if they have kids with them, are they nice to the kids? Are these kids, like, their nieces and nephews? Are they their own? Is that dad? And there's mom still at home? Like, like you have all these questions, right? If you're a single person, you're out scoping. Uh, Vivian, I see, is making jokes about that, because you don't do that anymore. No, that was so 30 years ago. Yeah, good girl. But you do, you look for outward signs, but there's also something like this availability that people have about them. Because you can be a married person without your wedding ring on, and you might feel funny about not having your ring on, or for work you can't wear your ring, and there's an availability that you do or do not have. And maybe you're single for life and you're committed to that. There's an availability that you do or do not have whether you're taken or just, you know, taken by the Lord. So it's obvious. It should be obvious to people around you if you're in a relationship with someone. Just how you talk and how you present yourself. It should be obvious if Jesus is in you. And Jesus said um, that, that he is the light of the world and he has made us the light of the world. Turn with me to um, John chapter 8. We're going to hang out in John chapter 8 for a little bit. Because there's this confrontation that Jesus has with these religious people that just um, is really interesting to see how he doesn't answer their question. He answers them, but not in a way that they're going to actually understand what he's saying or even accept what he's saying. Because as we press into Christ, as Jesus has given us the light, he should outshine us. He should make us stand out. All right, John 8, I hear most people are there. Verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. So Jesus is obviously the one in charge. He is obviously sent from God, and yet they're saying, we don't believe you. Your, your claims are not valid. People are not always going to believe that you have Jesus or that you have a life change. But the longer that you follow him, the longer that you press into him, the more obvious it will be to people that you are indeed a changed person. Your language will change. Your level of tolerance for um, foul language, and I'm not saying like, you know, expletives, but even like dirty jokes and things that make, uh, just are ugly to be around, that those things will start to diminish. Your attitude towards people that don't look like you or think like you or talk like you will change. Like something about Christ in you will start outshining your earthly flesh and began to be a testimony and a witness to people about a new faith that you have in Christ. But what if they don't believe you? You say, well, Jesus said that when he was lifted up, he will draw all men to himself, and that when he goes to the Father, he will fill me up with his presence. And then it's not Christ in me that you see. It's not me that you see, but it's Christ in me that you see, which is the hope of glory. And so the Pharisees are like, nah, I don't believe you. Jesus doubles down on it. 
he tries again and he tells them this. Jesus told them, these claims are valid even though I make them about myself, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you don't know this about me. I love that he has this authority and just this open thing like I'm making him about myself. You don't have to understand it, but I can't change who I am. I can't change my nature. Um, verse 15, you judge me by human standards, but I do not judge anyone. And if I did, my judgment would be correct in every respect because I am not alone. The Father who sent me is with me. So Christians, if your Christianity is showing, if your Jesus, the light of Jesus in you is showing, it's going to be obvious to people and they are going to have certain expectations of you. We talked before that Christians are perceived as judgmental or too political or hateful or bitter or rude, like all of the things that are not attractive to anyone. But the more that you're like Jesus, you can be bold in your faith, and then you say, you know, I'm not going to make any judgments even about the Christians, but I know the Father who will eventually make judgments, and that will be a scary thing. So what I want to do is I just want to introduce you to Jesus and show you that his way of living is so much more fun, so much more joyful. It is an exciting place to be because, you know, the world and the things of the world are going to hit them the same way that it hits you. You might look around and say, like, these, the people that I'm looking at, they have everything they need. They have their health. They're getting the job promotions that I thought I should get, and yet they're not following after Jesus. And Jesus says, can you still worship me? Can you still make sure that I am obvious in you in your hardship? Because at some point in your life, your friend will go through a hard thing. And if the Jesus in you is attractive and outshining your own personality, they will say, how did you have peace when you didn't get that job promotion? How did you have your heart healed when your heart was broken? I, I want to know because I saw you handle your bad stuff so well that I too want to learn how to handle mine. But the secret is, church, is that we have to be in a relationship long enough for them to be able to go through that hardship. Oftentimes, we like to write people off. And in restructuring faith, you say, I don't want to be friends with anybody but Christians. Well, maybe you, maybe you need to be around people that God has called you to. And there are certain people that will pull you down and certain people that you may need to break ties with. But as a rule, we want to be around people that don't think like us, talk like us, act like us. When Christ in us is the hope for them as well. So um, I love this here at the end. It says, the Father, Jesus is saying, the Father who sent me is with me. Now, if you have the Holy Spirit, the Father who sent Jesus is with you too. God the Father who sent Jesus is with you too. Sometimes we forget that we've got a heavenly Father watching over us. We get caught up in our own stuff and we forget. I'm in the middle of you know, crying and praying, he's, and God's like, hello, I'm your father, and I can take care of this for you. If nothing else, but to give me a heavenly perspective of what I'm going through. The same God that was with Jesus, that, that Jesus then left behind, for, left behind, he said, it is a good thing that I'm going away, because the Father, the Holy Spirit in him is the one that is with you now. We read about that the day of Pentecost, and maybe at some point I'll go into all the different ways that the Holy Spirit fell on people, how the Holy Spirit fills people. Um, and sometimes it happens while somebody's preaching. Sometimes it happens while um, you get your laid on by hands, like somebody's praying over you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's just by yourself crying out for God to fill you up. There are all these different examples in the Bible where the Holy Spirit fills people up, and they don't exactly know, like, all right, what is the formula? They don't exactly know, like, how do I recreate this? And the fact is, is that we serve such a creative God that we don't need to have a formula for being filled with the Spirit. We just need to be obedient. If God says, I want to draw closer to you, but you keep putting this in front, you keep turning on the television before you turn on your, you know, the Bible app or start listening to the Word of God. I want to fill you up. I want to partner with you, but you keep turning on the complaints, focusing on that one-third of your life that's terrible instead of turning on the gratitude and allowing me to fill you up. Jesus often withdrew and went to lonely places 
because he had to be reminded over and over again that, that his source is not his own energy. His source was God the Father. I know it gets a little bit tricky in here because Jesus is God, so why did he have to spend time with his Father? It's because Jesus knew what it was like to be worn out from being with people. He knew what it was like to be worn out from being around kids or just immature people or co-laborers in Christ who were not getting it. So he had to withdraw and have God the Father speak again to him. I would have loved, loved, loved to be part of that. I mean, we only have that time of where he was tempted in the wilderness to kind of get an insight of what happened at that point. But I would love, did he just take a good nap? Did he spend time just crying and making sure nobody else saw how weak he really is? Because that's what he did in the garden. Maybe that's what he did often. Maybe as he withdrew often to cry. <laughs> Not to feel sorry for him, but just that the weight of the world that he was carrying was too much. And he had to go back to the source. So we have this um, great commission, what the Father who has sent Jesus has sent us to. Jesus said, it is good that I am going away because I am um, going to send you the Holy Spirit. Huh. I'm getting excited about what I'm about to share in a little bit. Okay, so uh, Matthew 28, 20, this is called the Great Commission. Say Great Commission. Great Commission. There are people that have, have been in church for a while, and then that word just kind of flies over the top of their head. Great Commission. Commission means to be sent. Uh, we commission missionaries to be sent to other places. We, uh, maybe we commission our, our graduates, right, to go into other places and be light for others that they're going to be around. So Great Commission is um, before the day of Pentecost, before Jesus leaves, so it's right in between this time when Jesus is still walking around on the earth after his resurrection. 500 people or so saw him walking around after the resurrection. It wasn't just the couple of women at the tomb and some disciples in a closed room. He was around walking for quite a while, and he got to hang out with people. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, and it's also in Mark and in Luke, it says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is the great commission. The same God that was with Jesus is with us too, and we have proof because Jesus said, I am going away, I'm going to send another, he will be the advocate, he's going to teach you everything you need to know, he's going to remind you of the lessons that we have spoken here. You're like, how in the world did they come up with this about Jesus? It's because the Holy Spirit was with lots of people reminding them of what Jesus did when he was alive, or walking, I should say alive, walking on the earth. While the disciples were still alive, they thought Jesus is going to return soon. And so they didn't start writing this down until they started getting martyred, killed off one at a time. And they're like, we're getting older. Jesus hasn't returned yet. We better write some of this down. But guess what? The same Holy Spirit that's reminding the disciples how to write the Gospels is the Holy Spirit with you now. I think sometimes we sell ourselves short and we forget that we have this treasure of the Holy Spirit in these fragile, broken jars. You know, it's a light inside of a jack-o'-lantern, right? Just a pumpkin, you just put the candle, you know, put the lid on the pumpkin, no face on it, it just goes out. We need the face. But we have to be broken for that to happen. We have to be able to be um, surrendered to God for that to happen. So, um... Uh, I did say this once, but I'm going to say it again. Jesus does not um, follow formulas. God does not use formulas. He uses the obedient. Okay, so one of the things um, that Jesus said, it's good that I'm going away. I tell you the truth. This is John 14, 12. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater because I'm going to the Father. All right, so I was like, Jesus, do you ever get like low-key, like jealous that we do more than you got to do? Because Jesus, at the end of his life, he had 120 disciples that were waiting in the upper room. 
At one point, he had 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 20,000 people. He was feeding bread, and they'd follow him around. And, he, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, I've got a, a congregation of 20,000. But then he starts sharing about communion. Like, now you've got to eat my body and drink my blood. And everybody's like, oh, I'm out of here. If it's not physical, I don't want it. And so Jesus gained as many people as he lost over and over and over again. He even lost one of his closest friends in Judas. So, so Jesus, at the end of his life, he had just, a, you know, 120 people that were willing to wait on him. It says, if I go to the Father, you will do greater works than me. The day of Pentecost shows us this. Because uh, the fire falls on that 120 people. They go out, and it says in the Bible, 3,000 people were added in one day. Jesus was multiplied because of the Holy Spirit into 3,000 people. And then Christianity spread from that point. And then persecution kind of squished down on the church, and the church fled out into all parts of the world. And now we're... we're a, um, a result of that, of that persecution, of that stress of being pressed down and, and not knowing what's going to happen next, but knowing wherever you go, you're going to have the light of Christ within you. And to every single dark part of our world, we are supposed to go bringing the light of Jesus. It cannot stop with us in our safe little bubble. And so when we see that the church is under persecution, church attendance started to decline in the 1970s. We had a bit of a boom in the 1990s, and everybody was building, at least with the evangelical Christians, as they were once known, the formerly known as evangelicals. Uh, but the born-again Christians were building all these churches and getting people in the church, but it was a come-and-see approach. It was come-and-see. So the fire falls on the church. It says that people ran in to see what was going on. It was a come-and-see approach. Philip said, come and see this man I've been telling you about. But after Jesus went back up into heaven, the fire falls on them, and then the persecuted church goes, and then it's a go and do, from, or go and be. Instead of come and see, it's go and be. Go, therefore, into all the world into the dark places, not because you have anything special, but because the Holy Spirit in you has commissioned you to go and be the light of the world. We are not to just keep it in here. If, you're, if your Christianity, if you're following Jesus only shows up on Sunday morning, you're probably doing something wrong. It should be obvious where you go that something is different about you in your school and at your work, in your, with your grandchildren, in the quietness of your own home. There should be something different about you. I talked about this last week, hypocrisy in the family, where the family goes to church and they act like everything is okay, and then when they go home, everything is not okay. That hypocrisy, that, that divide between who I am on the outside and who I am on, in my private life are in conflict with each other, and that drives people away from the church. But guess what, church? We can go after them because people still need to have jobs. You have a job. Unless you're retired, then you have a, a group of friends. Join a book club. They meet Mondays once a month, right, Ben? Yep, Amanda's book club. Go be around people that don't talk like you, think like you, or even read the same books as you. Go join a class at Marvin Memorial Library. Find something outside. Maybe you have a lot of doctor's visits. I know a lot of you in here have a lot of doctor's visits. Some of you watching online have a lot of doctor's visits. Wherever you go, maybe your ministry is to that nurse taking your blood that day. Or that doctor is going to come in and give you a report you may or may not want to hear. And you can look at that doctor and you can testify to the Jesus in you. doesn't mean you have to fake it. Oh, thank you, doctor. I'm looking forward to the suffering. Oh, no. But you can say, uh, the God that took me through these other things is going to get me through this as well. And that will be a testimony to the doctor. Maybe the thing that you are going through is because God needs to minister to that doctor or nurse who's around people all the time, just bitter and in despair because of the bad things going on. And they need you to be the light. So uh, I often get asked this. Okay, good. I'm watching the time. Oh, no. <clears throat> I'm going to wait just a second. So will Jesus be jealous of this church? Is he like, man, man, I wish I could. I wish I could have done all that. I would have been so cool, God. But he is with us. 
Isaiah 53, 11, when he, and this is in the Old Testament, talking about Jesus, when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, that is, Jesus suffered and died, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Jesus is so happy when we are using the Holy Spirit as it is intended to outshine everyone around us because of the goodness of God working in us, to wrestle with things and not be ashamed of talking about the hard things you're going through, but knowing that God is going to get you through it. When Jesus sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied, and because of his experience, many will be counted righteous. So then, what do you say if you say, like, I'm not a teacher or a preacher. Like, I don't know about this teaching and preaching. That's not my gift. Well, it is now. Teach just means to tell people what you already know. You spend time in the Word of God, and then you just take that to people. I'm going through some things that the person next to you says, and you say, let me pray about that. I worship a God that says that He has healed all our sicknesses and all our disease, and He is wisdom. Um, your Christianity should be different than other people around you if they're not following the same Jesus. Because Jesus said he is the light of the world. So where do you start? Where do you start with people? You begin with prayer. You begin with prayer here on Sunday mornings. You pray Sunday afternoons. You pray Mondays. You set an alarm for noon every day or whenever you ha know you have a break. That you are going to be praying that God begins to open doors for you to speak the name of Jesus. How do I make my light shine as I'm usually feeling a wimp? Oh, here's mine. I usually feel a wimp about being a Christian. I want my light to shine before people so they may see the Father and glorify God because of my good deeds, right? That, like, I would love that. But what if I'm feeling especially wimpy? It doesn't matter how you feel. It matters how you're being obedient. But you take, make every decision, both public and private, in view of the cross. You read your Bible in public, Take your Bible to McDonald's or to the cafeteria. Read your Bible publicly. Um, pray out loud for people. If somebody in front of you starts talking about something, it, happened to me, uh, it happens to me every once in a while. Um, nursing home is a great opportunity to pray for people. Um, uh, this woman, she was just talking. She goes, somebody in this room stole my pearl necklace <laughs> at the nursing home yesterday. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's pray about that. I don't know. It's a, it's a memory care unit, so I don't know if somebody in the room stole her necklace. Some visitors were there, and they looked at me like, what's going on right now? I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. We'll just pray about it. But I don't just say, I'm going to pray for you and walk away. Right there, I say, you know what? I serve a living God who's living in me right now. You say this in your head, right? But I believe that Jesus has the power to heal you. I believe Jesus has the authority to work in your life. I believe that you're going to get wisdom because I, we serve, I serve a good, good father who answers me when I ask him. And you just pray a, a brief prayer to the point. You say, now how are you doing? Okay. And if they're still doing poorly and you feel like you should pray for them again, <laughs> do it. They feel a little uncomfortable, you walk away and you say, thank you, Jesus, for answering. You don't have to worry about it anymore because you took it to the throne. Oh, give yourself permission to be human. Sometimes we think as Christians we need to hide everything, but you need to be the same person so that you have accountability for your actions. The same person on Wednesday morning at Wednesday morning coffee should be the same person here on Sunday morning. Like that same, there, there is, I mean, there are like rules like, thank you for wearing, like, shoes and shirts when you come into the building. Like, thank you. There are rules to being around people, right? But give yourself permission to be the same person wherever you go. Uh, remembering the guidelines that if somebody is rejecting you for Jesus, you have a Father who will help you in the middle of your questions. And I think some of us were like, well, I don't want to offend anyone. Yeah, but have you tried yet? I've been trying to offend people, and they just keep getting more and more blessed by it. I'm like, can I pray for you? And they're like, I'm, you know, whatever. And so I pray for them, and I think I'm going to offend them by saying I want to pray for you, and they're not offended. I keep waiting for it. So I don't think that we're taking enough risks as Christians. Okay, maybe that's for another time. The last thing is to repent and forgive quickly. 
Repent quickly, forgive quickly. 1 John 3.18, this is the last one. Under the power of the Holy Spirit, we align ourselves to God. And we say, God, purify me, make me holy, set me apart. 1 John 3.18. Dear children, let's see, do not let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Okay, the Son of God, that is Jesus, he came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, it, living in you, can also destroy the works of the devil. And the devil's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy the thing that God has planted in your heart. And so you press into him and you say, I don't want to keep on sinning. I want to be pure. I want to have, you know, maybe just my testimony, my witness to be something that is contagious and attractive to people. For even my, my witness before my coworkers, even if I can't say, like, let me preach to you for a minute, because that might be taken the wrong way, that who I am on the inside is shining out for other people to see. And you're done with sin. They say, hey, do you want to come to this party? You say, yeah, but I've got to leave at 10 o'clock because I know what happens at 1045. I'm not saying don't go do fun things, but you know that the Holy Spirit is going to give you the discernment on when you're taking that light into dark places. Don't keep on sinning. Don't keep falling for the trap of the enemy. Realize that the one who is working in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So get into the book of Acts this week. Get into seeing how people had to restructure their faith from this faith that was um, based on all these laws and rules to a faith based on love and forgiveness and hanging out with Gentiles. Gasp. <laughs> Gentile is anyone that's not Jewish. But Jesus opened the door wide open for us to be able to walk into relationship with people. Don't be afraid. Take a little risks, and we'll go into more of this training and things as we can. But um, I would just want to honor your time today. But read Acts and, and ask the Holy Spirit, like, hey, so the same Spirit that was working with these guys that were able to speak in front of 3,000 people will be with me when I want to speak one-on-one -on -one with my sister who's far from God. You're telling me the same Spirit, and, and, and the answer is yes. The same Father who looked over Jesus, looked at Jesus and filled him up is the same father at work in us and so let's make jesus proud this week let's make him proud all right is there anyone here that i can pray for um, specifically i'm not sure what you might be going through might be related to this might be something else yeah a few mm -hmm. okay all right let's pray heavenly father i just thank you for just the way that you are ministering to us through your Holy Spirit. And we have all these opportunities, Lord, and sometimes we think we're going to offend people, but I don't think we've ever really, at least not in Ohio, ever crossed that line of being super offensive. And so I just thank you that, that you're going to open doors and you're going to soften hearts. And the same Holy Spirit that worked in Jesus that he gave to the disciples is the Holy Spirit at work in us. Help us to be bold and brave and courageous. Not relying on our own power, but 